everybody out there. You're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. You're in my corner, and I have a very special guest in the corner. Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? No. No? Not okay. really. <laughs> That's okay. We can play patty cake instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Phone patty cake. The engineers will hate that. Yeah. Uh, no. Hi, I'm Terry Doty. I'm a voice director and actor working, namely, with Funimation Entertainment. How's it going? It's going good, and I hope it's going good for you, too. Woo! Yeah, it's Saturday. It's been a long week, so I'm just happy to, you know, not be prepping for shoots and stuff like that. Woo! I can understand that. The weekend is when I chill. (laughs) Yeah. Now, obviously, we want to ask, you know, what originally sparked your interest in acting? And was it necessarily acting, or was it something else? Well... I don't know, you know, junior high is when, you know, people, like, you know, you start getting the opportunity to be in theater and stuff like that, although for my junior high it was speech, which was supposed to be also theater, which I found hilarious, but uh, that just really wasn't for me, and then, you know, in high school you're required to do an arts credit, and I... Um, I'm not very artsy. I I love to paint and stuff like that, but I really don't like rules. (laughs) And so um, what it became is I I joined theater arts and almost immediately, you know, fell in love with it because I I had to do a lot of the the research in the origin of theater arts, and I'm a huge uh, fan of Greek mythology and all that, so I started immediately reading, you know, Antigone and stuff like that, Homer's Iliad, and I got kind of obsessed with that, and I started working on more of the technical aspect of it, but then I started doing open mic shows and stuff like that as a comedian, and I realized I I really love just not necessarily becoming someone else, but being able to explore things that you wouldn't be able to explore just in your normal day-to-day life, and that just kind of grabbed a hold of me. I mean, off and on, I'll I'll take back, uh, the acting will take a back seat, you know, in lieu of uh, working to make money, but, I mean, acting and voiceover, especially voice acting, voiceover, uh, is just, um, the second I really learned, you know, what's required of it, I really haven't stopped learning about it. I I absolutely adore acting, and, uh, you know, whether it be theater, which Joel McDonald's amazing at, or voiceover, which I really admire, J. Michael Tatum, Colleen Clinkenbeard, and uh, as far as people that I personally know, I um, I don't see myself stopping acting anytime soon. So I've I've been kind of involved with, with with it for about 15 years now, and I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. Well, if you love it, you got to do it. That's right. <laughs> and now, how did you get involved with Funimation? The Fun- Funimation is just one of those things that. When you learn about it, you suddenly realize that everyone around you is like, oh, yeah, Funimation, do 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 But, you know, watching watching Dragon Ball at my friend's house, you know, on Tsunami when I would come home from school or go to their house, but, you know, I'm like, oh, Dragon Ball. You know, I you don't think about who's responsible for making it available to you in America. You just go, like, oh, that's anime. Um, and... You know, just kind of went, whatever, but um, by doing theater and by having, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend who's involved in it, my my husband had been a sound engineer for several years. He was just my boyfriend at the time, which is funny now. But uh, starting up with Funimation as an ADR engineer, he'd only been doing it for a couple of months, and he was teamed up, or he was paired up with an ADR director that was just doing uh just starting out too which was joel mcdonald and joel knew of my theater background and he just kind of went off of steven's uh steven's recommendation and called me in i had no idea what was required or anything before i went in but he called me in for subasa the reservoir chronicled uh season two and the second i i did it i i didn't want to stop but yeah that's how i initially got in but i uh you know, ended up doing a lot more than just voiceover there. Well, were you panicked or unsure when you're like, uh, when you got in and you were like, okay, the, the, what do I do now? <laughs> oh my God, yes. Um, I I haven't told anybody this, but I mean, you know, and I'm sure you guys can keep a secret. 
you know, not a show or anything. Yeah, but we'll no, uh, it's it's <laughs> it's re, it's I, I, it's worth mentioning now. But I never told any. I didn't. I never told Joel. But being that my husband was the engineer on it, um, I wrote up some fake scripts and you know two flaps of an existing anime and just copied the video of it just to practice. <laughs> Uh, doing it just to doing it at home, and I'm like, man, this sucks. This is horrible. But uh, you know, you really just got to trust your director there. And so when I finally went in, yes, I think it's pretty obvious uh, in the first couple of roles uh, or the first couple of lines of a character um, that they're still getting the feel of it. Sometimes, hopefully, not all the time, but yes, I'm very nervous. And also, Joel, Joel's just so relaxed and his. Uh, you know, his relaxed attitude sometimes just makes you that more, that much more nervous because you're just like, well, like, he's just so relaxed and why aren't I relaxed? And oh my God, now I'm tensing up even more because he's so relaxed and I'm not. What's going on? Ugh. But um, clearly I got over it because, you know, it'll, it'll show in your performance. So if you're not having fun with it, you know, people are going to hear that. You know, that that sounds like me if I don't have so much reaction from somebody i'm like am i doing something wrong what's what's going on i need more input here yes oh my gosh yes because i kind of i kind of feed off energy uh you know not like i feed off energy <laughs> but it's, i i like you know kind of doing this wall ball thing where it's just like and ha and the tennis tennis ball is just going to keep on going back and forth back and forth but if i'm all hey what's going on everybody and they're like, Sup. i don't know how to react to that <laughs> Well, because you, uh, you can't be as energetic. Like, well, you can try, but it's it's not going to work out very much for you. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Now, I'm curious if you could explain to the listeners out there um, what ADR directing is and ADR script writing is. Uh, okay. Um, ADR directing, uh, it's, it's a funny term because when you hear ADR, if you were just to Google it or whatever search engine is your poison, uh, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Google, um, it would stand for automatic dialogue replacement, which is clearly, uh, a, you know, a lot more goes into it. And I know I'm kind of stealing things from uh, what Chris Ayers and J. Michael Tatum have said in several, in several, explanations of this but um really that's why i like to say voice director instead but i mean really what we are is you know steven's an adr engineer i'm an adr director um sometimes but um we work off the adaptive scripts that a lovely writer and the writing team headed by john bergmeyer we we work off of what they've done to create characters in the english sense by no um by no means you know discrediting what the Japanese have done, but, you know, making our own version of it because that's what Japanese people want us to do. And what we do, we do everything from auditions to casting, uh, from auditions, casting the characters, rewriting uh, at a moment's notice in booth. And the writers um, really have, I guess, you have to put your faith in the writers uh, uh, quite a lot because what they have to do is they have to make it work. They have to make the dialogue work and make the show work for an American audience or an English-speaking audience, not necessarily just American. But it, it involves fitting the flaps. I know some people, namely like of or our uh, older anime, were a little more forgiving of flaps and just kind of let flaps go over, but we do our best as writers to make the dialogue fit the flaps because they can be incredibly distracting if they don't fit, and making the dialogue work for that, and uh, the translating department also has a big part in that. They help us out quite a lot, but really, uh, director and writer go hand in hand. Um, if you're not a writer on the show that you're directing, uh I know that I, I can't speak for everybody, but I like to work very closely with the person writing it. So if I don't get something, they'll explain why they wrote it that specific way and all that kind of jazz. But really, um, in booth, once I've cast everything, uh, auditions and casting take about a week, sometimes longer, depending on the show, how big the show is or how many characters are in the show itself. And... Um, 
we start recording and booking people through our talent coordinator, uh, who has a very hard job in itself um, of calling people, calling agents, and booking them and scheduling our booth time. But I, uh, the director works closely with an ADR engineer or a sound engineer, and they record everything as well as set levels, help mix a little bit, and help us create the atmosphere for the English version of it. But really, And then at the end of it, once, let's say, a contract, which can be a movie, uh, the length of it would take to record a movie or six, seven episodes to finish that batch. That's what we call a contract. And uh, once we finish that contract, we review it, make any notes, like, oh, we need to have them do this again, pick up, do do do, and kind of work back and forth and then send it to mix. So, I mean, what we do is a small, just a small, small part of the whole production process of it. But, you know, in, in a nutshell, that's it's a very big nutshell, I know. But in a nutshell, that's what ADR and adaptive script writing is about. And I absolutely love it. Um, I know I've only written a couple of adaptive scripts myself, namely for, or not namely, only for, uh, Initial D, The Fourth Stage, and Corpse Princess, although I like to call it Shikubana Hime. And uh, I absolutely love it, but people that, you know, make it an art form, and as far as my field are people like Jamie Markey, Monica Rial, and J. Michael Tatum. Again, he's kind of a jack of all trades, but um, it's it's great. It's great, and you can tell that these writers really kind of fall in love with the material, and they have fun making it work for an American audience. Well, even though that was a big explanation, now whenever anybody asks me a little bit about the process, I can just point to this interview now. Makes it easier on me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're welcome. Thank you very much. But I would assume... You're- that in some cases the writing would be difficult because there are some, you know, Japanese jokes or culture things that are really hard for the U.S. audience to grasp. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, and that's sometimes, you know, uh, there are some fans that really don't shy away from bringing that up. You know, I ran into that a lot with Baka and Tess directing it. Um, in, uh, Baka and Tess, Summon the Beast, and season one. Uh, and... You know, Jamie Markey and Chuck Huber were the lead writers on that show, and they would always have to make, you know, allowances and make excuses uh, to be like, well, I understand that this is a joke, but, you know, it works in Japanese. It doesn't work in English. You can go ahead and and they'll write uh, alts or alternative lines saying this one goes with a Japanese. This one would make sense to an English-speaking audience which one do you want? And usually in that case, um, I would leave it up to the producers to make that call, but I would record both and note which one I preferred. And most of the time, it still still is the Japanese, but if it's a show, let's say like uh, Sergeant Frog or Baka and Tess, sometimes uh, you can can make allowances and go, well, you know, people that watch anime are into the Japanese culture. They would get this joke, but what about people that maybe are just watching something to watch it, we we can't leave them out in the dark. So we should probably just make this work for an English-speaking audience. And, you know, if you really like that joke, watch it in the Japanese as well. Why not? Which is understandable. I mean, now, with DVDs, this magical thing called DVDs, you can switch the languages and turn on subtitles. (sighs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Sorry, I I get on people's cases all the time because... um, you know, I we're in the in the anime world, so so let's let's be honest. You know, you have all those people that complain. It's like, well, I don't like the dub. You can still buy the dub, and you can still get your Japanese. I don't see what you're complaining about. Right, right. I mean, whenever we, uh, and I say we, I can't speak for Funimation because uh, clearly, you know, um, they do a lot of stuff, and I'm only a small cog in the machine, but. Whenever they release something or say, hey, this is coming out, they don't go, now, in English only, unless you're stupid. Like, they never do that. <laughs> they, they, make it, they make it available and say, here it is. It's available now. And, of course, they'll more than likely showcase the Japanese because, or uh, the English because we're an English-speaking country and this is where we're distributing it. But by no means, uh, I mean, I'm a big, I guess, rare, uh, not... I'm in that nice little middle ground that 
I love both. I can watch both. And I guess the biggest example of it is, you know, I fell in love with Black Butler through the Japanese version. And, you know, now there's the English version available, and I can watch both and appreciate both as separate entities and not have to go, well, they really did it better in Japanese here and, you know, stuff like that. It's, you can you can have both, or you can go, yeah, there's an English version too, but I really prefer the Japanese or vice versa, and nobody's getting hurt, so don't worry. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't. I don't want to discredit any voice actors or anything. Then I would lose my job. Um, but <laughs> but there there are people out there who who are also very afraid to say that they didn't like portions of the dub. When mm-hmm. you know, I I think you guys are 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 okay to constructive criticism, not bashing, not trolling. The internet's fond of that. But actual people who have a have a legitimate concern as to, well, I didn't think it fit the character quite much myself or something mm-hmm. along those lines. And I, I think a lot of fans don't understand that either. No, no, they uh they don't. And you know, it's it's not necessarily their fault that they don't get that, but you know, to attack someone, namely I think where I really have a problem, and I know other directors can uh, attest to this as well, is that um, what I really have a problem with when someone is not necessarily going, you know, uh, I understand that you were this voice and this, and I didn't care for it. Um, I I have gone personally, well, um, I'm sorry that you didn't care for it. Clearly, we're not going to be on the same page here, but I'm thank you for watching the show. You can do something like that. But if it's, hey, your voice for this character sucks. Um, That's mean. <laughs> me as a, yes, me as a voice actor, and I'm right into it. Me as a voice actor, I, you know, I go, well, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, please leave me alone. But for, for me as a director, when an actor that I personally cast, which I always cast myself, when they're getting flack for something that I have greenlit, that's the problem. Don't yell at the actor. Don't say you hate that. Blame it on me. Like if you're the, I'm the reason that you didn't like this piece of voice. I cast that character. I said that line was great. You don't like it. I mean, don't, don't yell at the actor. Yell at me if you like. But um, or if you don't like it, how about just leave it alone. Well, like me, I get a lot of flack because um, I, I'm not sure if you've ever seen it, but I'm a big Sailor Moon fan. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I, I love the dub, even though it's cheesy and they changed a lot of things. I absolutely adore it. And I, I also appreciate the Japanese for what it is, but I, I, I get a lot of people angry at me because I'm willing to stand by the dub. But it, it's funny because I know it's not just the choice of the voice actors. You have the people who write, you have the people who cast, you have the, you have even the company that publishes it and distributes it as well because they were trying to market it to little kids. And that's fine, so they made those changes. And I, I can understand that, but some people can't, sadly. Yeah, no, they, they really uh, they really can't. And, you know, again, you know, you can – or whenever someone's critiquing me on anything, I try to look at, look at it from their perspective, you know, and not just be like, well, it sucks to be you later. Um, it's, you know, uh, a lot of – there are a lot of dubs or just shows in general where people, like, it would have been so much better if they'd done just this one thing or they did so many things wrong with it, it made me hate the show. You know, I mean, not uh, – there are tons of movies or shows where I'm like, man, it was great until this happened. But I'll still watch it. Um, no one's forcing you to watch anything. I mean, if they are, you know, please seek help. Don't immediately go to the Internet and say, <laughs> I didn't like this and this is why, <laughs> because I was strapped to a chair for five hours and made to watch it. I'd be more concerned with the fact that you're strapped to a chair rather than that you watched something you didn't care for. Hey, they killed off my favorite character and lost in, like, the first season. I still watched it. Just saying. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, um, that's really interesting for us because we don't really get to hear your guys' opinion on that. So thank you for for actually voicing your opinion on that and not being like, oh, that's taboo. Ah, ah." (laughs) No, I I suppose I've 
been known to be opinionated. I, I, I don't, I, I can see why some people, because I'm a big fan of just the entertainment industry and I'm schooled in this industry. That's what my degree is in. I, under, I understand that not everybody's going to like what you're putting out there and that's fine. Never have I taken something that anyone has had to say about anything that I've done to heart in a negative way. Granted, I love and absolutely do take to heart the positive things and hearing, you know, I really like what you did here. That's great, and it's an ego boost. But, you know, if you can't learn from even the harshest critiques, some people will call them critiques. I'll, that's what I'll call them right now. Um, <laughs> some, are, some are just flat-out um, vicious. But, you know, you're not going to please everybody. Everybody knows that, especially people that work in this industry. We're very used to rejection and people not uh, people having a lot of opinions, not necessarily good. So, you know, uh, please always just be kind about it. If you're just doing it viciously, I mean, no one's going to listen to that. Well, now, is there any place on the Internet where people can, you know, tweet you positive things <laughs> or Facebook you positive things or a website, oh, anything yes. like that? <laughs> well, I'm so glad you asked. Hmm. Well, uh, I am on Twitter. Uh, you can just search my name. Um, I'm at T, at T Dodally. Um, yeah, if you just search it also. But um, Rick Cole, who's a fan of the podcast that I do with J. Michael Tatum called That Anime Show, thatanimeshow.com, um, he created me a, a cool little fan fan page on Facebook called the Terry Doty Appreciation Society, and I think it's really neat. It's a, <laughs> you can't ever feel bad looking at that page, because I, it, it's very humbling, too. I, I can't believe so many people are on that, and they have so many neat little things to say, but uh, that, those are ways to get a hold of me. Also, I, you know, I do friend people on Facebook. Uh, not everybody, but um, people just, you know, people, just fans in general, but I also have that anime shows fan page uh, that people can reach me at. I, I really do like to talk to fans. It's really nice to hear what they have to say. And also, I've made so many friends that way. So, you know, conventions are great, too. But, yeah, uh, I'm big, heavy, heavy on the computer. Twitter, I just joined in June, and I'm still getting my sea legs on that. But, yeah, I, I'm available to be talked to. You know, and if it's negative criticism, you'll know because it'll be deleted. <laughs> <laughs> well, on to that anime show since you mentioned it. I'm kind of curious, and for the fans out there who don't know this, um, it's, it's a podcast where you guys have special guests on. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm kind of curious why you guys decided to start doing it. Oh, well, you know, I can't believe it's it seems like we've been doing it forever, but really we've only been doing it for, in January it'll be two years. But what it was is, you know, when I was, when I was going to finally pick a, a degree to major in, uh, it was originally theater, but then I realized, I'm like, I can still do theater and, you know, do all this, but still have a degree in something else. And I decided to focus on radio, TV, film, namely radio, because I'd always kind of had this love for just DJs and uh, not necessarily like, hey, this is, you know, this is Chris with now blah, blah, blah. You're listening. Let's hear the next Nickelback song. Yeah. Like, not that way. I really like talk radio. Um, I love to, I just, I've always loved to people watch and just listen to people's conversations and get people's perspective on just anything and everything uh, involving the world, especially if it's something that you're really into. And um, when I got into the radio TV department, they, you know, it was brought to my attention rather quickly by my, my instructor, my main instructor throughout my degree, that radio is kind of a dying industry, so maybe focus more on the film and television aspect of it, which worked out for the best because I, I learned I really love directing and writing, but there was still kind of that bug to do something related to radio. And after I uh, after I finished up my degree, I started uh, directing at Funimation and um, became very good friends with Jim Michael Tatum. And it became pretty obvious. People started making little jokes like, you guys should do a little radio show because... Uh, you guys clearly have a lot of opinions. I'm like, no, really? 
and, um, you know, we kind of toyed around with the idea of doing a podcast. I mean, I have my own home studio as well as a lot of recording gear because I'm married to a sound engineer. We have a lot of gear and a whole room dedicated to it and nothing else. So maybe maybe we could do something with it. But it wasn't until I saw that someone was looking, someone with radio booths and making an Internet streaming kind of radio site was looking for shows uh, that I went ahead and called without immediately having an idea. And I told Tatum, I'm like, I would love to do it, but I don't want to do it alone. Would you do it with me? Well, what would we talk about? And, you know, well, we're both in the anime industry. He's like, yes, but isn't there something already about that? Well, yeah, but not not for what I have in mind. And he asked for an explanation, and I really couldn't give him one. My my way of convincing him was, what have you got to lose? Except maybe a couple bucks to rent out the booth. What have, what have we got to lose? And it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, you know, it really is, for the most part, it really is just us talking naturally. Granted, there are some things we're like, okay, I don't want to talk about that. Let's not talk about that. But uh, we did the first three shows streamed live, and I really... You know, it's not hard for me to not cuss, but I, if it's just natural conversation, I would prefer to. And um, I know that there are there are restrictions to streaming live and not being able to cuss and not being able to talk about, you know, certain subjects. And we just didn't like the way it was going there, just the audio aspect of it. Um, I'm kind of a stickler for that, namely because my husband's an engineer. I know how things are supposed to sound, so I wasn't very happy. And uh, talked to Tatum about it, talked to my husband, Stephen, about it, and we went ahead and just decided to record it from my home. And um, it, that's when it really started becoming much more fluid, what we were doing. And really what it is is we call ourselves that anime show, and actually the person that uh, was booking us for the, the streaming thing came up with it. We didn't know what to call ourselves, and she went, well, for right now, we'll just call you that anime show. And we kind of went like, huh, okay. And so she spelled anime wrong, which I found hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we we just, you know, Stephen's always recording in another room, and we call ourselves that anime show, but it's it's about us being the dub industry insiders that we are and being able to get interviews that aren't necessarily always available or easy to book for other people because we live in the area that uh, what we do, uh, there's kind of a hot spot in this area, and why not kind of do our, almost like a, like a panel that we would do at a convention, but just out of the comfort of our own home. And it just kind of took on a life of its own. We can be very goofy. We can also, we don't stray away from talking about hot button issues unless it's politics because that's boring. And occasionally we talk about anime. But when we do, it's uh, it, it gets a lot more in depth than what I think some panels can do just because of time restrictions and all that stuff. But uh, I really enjoy doing the show. I get to do a show with my best friend and my husband and we do our best to make the fans feel like they're involved and they're a part of the show. And, I mean, I, I couldn't say that we'll be doing it forever, but as long as we are, it's, it's been an absolute blast. So. Awesome. Well, I highly suggest that the fans out there check it out because if you like our show, you'll probably like their show as well. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's interviews with your favorite people. You guys love that. Yeah, and sometimes not your favorite people, but you should listen anyway, because maybe there will be a sword fight or leg wrestling or something like that. Or you'll learn something new. You never know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, and it's just, also, sometimes you just meet some of the most amazing people, or you get to learn about things that you didn't necessarily know about people that you thought you can uh, you considered very good friends, and because, because it's so relaxed and not formal at all, uh, People tend to talk about things that they don't normally bring up in panels or just normal interviews, not to say that they wouldn't, but it's it's pretty pretty relaxed and pretty chill. And, yes, not being able to cuss is a really, really nice thing. But yeah. 
I mean, I can understand it to a degree. For those out there who don't know, um, when I'm just talking to the staff off air, I curse like a sailor. I'm really bad. But on air, I have yet to, to let one slip after two years. And I, I don't know how, but it's... Uh, <laughs> It's it's something my brain is programmed and now it just it doesn't it knows when I'm on the radio. You can't say that. Don't say that. Right. Right. I I I do my best to actually when when uh Trina Nishimura was on our show uh in the middle of it uh because I I've been working a lot with just helping uh just helping out my my brother and stuff like that and helping my nephew and watching my nephew whenever I can and I mean, my my parents did not care, clearly, that they were cussing around me. Uh, I actually, at one point, got called into the principal's office. They brought in my dad, and they're like, well, she said this, and he's, you know, what's the big problem? And, like, cussing up a storm, like, what? It's just a word. Leave her alone. (laughs) And, you know, like, hey, awesome. So I can say this. He's like, you should really cut it down. But, yeah, I really don't care. But, um... In the middle of Trina's show, I mentioned that I'm watching my mouth, and it was around the time that, uh, actually, it was just a few days after the earthquake in Japan, and I wanted to know what I could do. Um, You know, just in my own way, I was helping, or I was one of the the people that was on the 24-hour marathon podcast that the One Piece podcast guys did. Shout out to them. The unofficial One Piece podcast is amazing. Zach, Steve, Ed, Manny, Jason, they're they are amazing people, Greg. And they did this benefit to try to raise money for Japan relief. And I, I really wanted to do something else, so I decided to create a swear jar. And the proceeds of the swear jar um, would go to help Japan. And... I didn't cuss for the entire episode, and uh, uh, for the entire episode of our podcast, which the stakes were that Tatum would have to finally come to yoga with me, and Trina would take me to brunch, <laughs> and and I won. And uh, you know, Tatum hasn't gone to yoga yet, but he will. Dang it! And then I kind of thought, I'm like, yeah, swear jar. Um, and I kind of wrote out like, okay, if I say this, it's worth this much. If I say this, it's worth this much. If I cut in another language, it's double anything here. And and I collected over three months, and I, my husband almost kind of regretted it. He's like, I mean, good job, but, geez, like, this is a lot of money. <laughs> so I ended up raising quite a lot, but, uh, like, over, I won't give an exact number because I didn't remember, but somebody asked me at Anime Fest how much, and it was over a grant. Well, congratulations. It's very nice. Oh, very true. Very well, true. I, yeah, I, but, yes, congratulations yeah. for being a potty mouth. It was for a good cause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if people say I've never done anything <laughs> because of my foul mouth. I can go, nah. <laughs> and now, since you mentioned conventions, do you have any conventions coming up? I do. I am. In November, I will be a guest. At Anna Maine in South Portland, Maine, and it's a, a first-year convention. It's hosted by the guys that do the Keep Anime Alive website, which I believe is keepanimealive.com. And they uh, they they decided to do a podcast. And uh, there are other guests other than myself, but I'm the only one announced right now. And in January, I will be doing Katorikan in. Oh, my gosh, what's the actual thing? I think it's in Jersey, but it's in the Philadelphia area. But it's Katori Khan, and I will be there. Johnny Young Bosch will be there. Michelle Knott, Stuart Zagnett, uh, Jamie McGonigal. And um, I'm really looking forward to that one because I haven't been to the north in a while. And uh, also, you know, Johnny Young Bosch, I'm a big Power Rangers fan, so that'll be fun. And Jamie McGonigal's absolutely amazing, and I love his efforts as far as trying to get equality as far as gay rights and all that, um, which I'm a big supporter of. And other than that, there are a couple of other conventions that we're still working out, but when I figure out if I can talk about it, I'll definitely keep people posted through Twitter and Facebook. Awesome. 
And since we're nearing the end of our interview, sad face, I was wondering if you'd be willing to participate in a 91.8 The Fan tradition. No. I'm kidding. Uh, that's that's okay. Hey, no, nobody has said no before, so we would, we would totally be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be the first. Uh, but basically, we ask if you'd be willing to do a radio bump for us. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the trick of this is that we do the takes live on air, and uh, any mess-ups you make, everybody hears them. Ooh. Yes. We basically ask if you'd be willing to say, hello, my name is, I do this, you can put in, I'm a voice actress, I'm a director, whatever you want to put in there are certain characters, that's where you can be as creative as you want, and you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Hmm. Hello, my name is Terry Doty. I play the voice of Virgo in Fairy Tale, and you're listening to 91.8. The fan. See, that wasn't so hard. You got it on your first take. <laughs> you must be professional or something. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners out there? Anything else? Uh, not necessarily tell them. I would like to thank everybody that listened to that anime show, um, making, you guys have made it what it is. And all the, the listeners and the supporters of the industry, I can't thank you immensely. You help put money and food on the table. You guys are amazing. And please continue to enjoy the stuff that I'm throwing at you. Well, thank you so much for this. This was a lot of fun. Oh, yes, it really was. You guys are great. And for anybody out there that missed any of this interview, don't fret. It'll be up on the website within the next few days.